coming up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak. Korea and New Zealand formally sign their free trade agreement. Under the deal, both countries will remove tariffs on most of their traded goods over the next 15 years. The United States announces Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will visit the White House and be the guest of honour at a state dinner on April 28th. Plus, Park Taiwan, Korea's marine boy and former Olympic swimming champion, has been banned from the sport for 18 months for failing a drug test. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Tuesday, March 24th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, Korea has completed the signing of its free trade agreement with New Zealand. The FTA, some five and a half years in the making, was finalised on Monday when President Park Geun-hye and visiting New Zealand Prime Minister John Key inked the deal at the presidential office of Chong Wa Day. All that remains is for the FTA to be ratified by the parliaments of both countries. Our Choi Yusan starts us off. President Park Geun-hye said Monday's signing of the Korea-New Zealand FTA will go down in history as a major event in 53 years of diplomatic relations between the two countries. The FTA 정식 서명으로 이제 양국 관계는 경제 분야는 물론이고 문화 또 인적 교류 그 안보 또 국제 협력 이런 다방 면에서 한 차원 더 높은 그런 협력을 on his fourth visit to Korea, Prime Minister John Key thanked President Buck for her leadership in resuming trade negotiations after a three-year deadlock. I'm sure that uh, the benefits to Koreans and New Zealanders will be significant over the years ahead, and so this is a very special and beautiful day to be in Seoul. Both countries have agreed to remove tariffs on most of their traded goods in 15 years. However, nearly 200 products categorized as sensitive items for Korea, such as rice, are exempt from the pact. Aside from trade, New Zealand will expand its working holiday quota to 3,000 Koreans a year and share training on its advanced agriculture and fisheries technology. At Monday's talks, the two leaders also discussed ways to integrate initiatives involving creativity and innovation as a new growth engine, agreeing to increase cooperation in science, ICT and film. President Buck said the latest trade deal will give Korea's agriculture sector an opportunity to become more globally competitive by learning from the New Zealand experience. She also anticipated more job opportunities for Koreans, both at home and abroad. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Now, the latest FTA with New Zealand is Korea's 13th. And while it goes without saying that the deal with Wellington is dwarfed by Seoul's agreements with economic powerhouses like the United States and the European Union, the new free trade deal is going to have a significant impact on the Korean economy. Our Shin Se Min reports. The latest free trade agreement between Korea and New Zealand is set to increase trade beyond the approximately 3.2 billion U.S. dollars generated last year. Most of the exchange products will have little to no tariffs, with Korea eliminating duties on 96 percent of all shipped goods from New Zealand in the next 15 years and New Zealand removing all taxes on Korean goods in seven years. Korean exporters shipping small electronic goods, auto parts and heavy equipment will see a boost as these goods will enter the market with low tariffs. And New Zealand's popular imports? Wine, beef and dairy products. The pact will just swap more than just products. It'll also open doors to Korean youth employment in New Zealand and easier exchange of agricultural technologies and expertise. New Zealand's Zespri has already helped Jeju Island Kiwi farmers. 
This year, Jeju Island kiwi made it into the Singaporean market for the first time, contributing to the regional economy. And Korean companies are also making headway into New Zealand with an ICT company that manufactures a smart card for transportation. But Koreans in the dairy and livestock industry aren't happy, as New Zealand's strong dairy industry will increase competition in the domestic market. Korea's Rural Economic Institute projected over 2 trillion won, or 1.8 billion U.S. dollars worth of domestic losses. But some experts advise patience. This is part of improving our competitiveness in the long run by giving a wider selection to consumers. Lowering trade barriers is only one part of the FTA's benefits. Although New Zealand isn't a large exporting partner, experts say with the right amount of government regulation and thorough monitoring, the agreement will generate mutual economic benefits. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Now in the rest of the day's news, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will make a one-week-long visit to the United States at the end of next month. Officials say Abe will visit the White House and be the guest of honor at a state dinner on April 28th. The White House says trade and particularly plans to conclude the so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP will be the main topic of conversation between U.S. President Barack Obama and Abe. Abe is also expected to become the first Japanese prime minister to ever address a joint session of the U.S. Congress at some point during his trip. If the speech is given the green light, some members of Congress and Korean-American civic groups are pushing to ensure Abe shows some remorse for Japan's past wrongdoings, particularly the Japanese military's sexual enslavement of Asian women, many of whom were Korean during World War II. Some well-known faces from Korea's political yesteryear have been in Japan this week on a diplomatic mission to try and repair the frayed relations between the two neighbors. Meeting Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Tokyo on Monday, the Korean delegation said it was high time for a leaders' summit. Our Connie Kim reports. A group of veteran political and economic leaders from South Korea has called on Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to restore strained bilateral ties. They said both Seoul and Tokyo should create conditions for a summit. Abe reportedly responded with a vow to strive for improved relations now and for the future of Japan. Japanese broadcaster NHK, however, said that Abe called for summit talks with no strings attached. The Japanese leader is set to deliver a World War II anniversary statement in August, but there are concerns that he will shift away from an apology issued in the 1995 statement by then Prime Minister Domichi Murayama regarding Japan's wartime atrocities. Abe has said that he wants his statement to reflect the current government's position on historical issues. Ahead of today's meeting, the South Korean delegation met with Japanese representatives on Sunday to discuss bilateral cooperation as this year marks the 50th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the two countries. Relations between Seoul and Tokyo are at a historic low, mainly due to Abe's repeated denial of Japan's historic wrongdoings. The former Korean and Japanese leaders plan on meeting again in May to come up with a proposal for diplomacy that they plan on presenting to both President Park Geun-hye and Prime Minister Abe. Connie Kim, Arirang News. A South Korean activist group says it will temporarily suspend its plan to fly anti-North Korea leaflets across the inter-Korean border. However, the leader of the group says he's only delaying the launch to give the North some time to take responsibility for and say sorry for the 2010 sinking of a South Korean warship. A failure to do so will mean the balloons will be floated on Thursday as originally planned. Our Jim Young gil has more. A group of activists led by North Korean defectors have called off plans to fly some half a million anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border this week. But there's a catch. North Korea must apologize for the 2010 sinking of the South Korean Cheonan warship, which killed 46 South Korean sailors. If they are so afraid of our anti-Pyongyang leaflets, then they should have apologized for the torpedo attack on the Cheonan warship. Then we wouldn't have sent the flyers. 
The activists said they will still send the leaflets and copies of the U.S. film The Interview if Pyongyang ignores their demand. North Korea has condemned the flyers as one of the greatest obstacles to overcoming South-North tensions and has not only threatened attacks but also a halt to family reunions and operations at the joint Kaesong Industrial Complex. We've seen in previous cases where North Korea stopped work at the Kaesong Industrial Complex because of anti-Pyongyang leaflets and limited access to the industrial park. The South Korean government says it does not have legal ground to curb such civic activities, but has asked the group to make wise decisions. The issue has raised safety concerns among residents in border regions. Last October, the two Koreas exchanged gunfire after the North attempted to shoot down balloons carrying similar leaflets. While no one was hurt, inter-Korean relations took a major hit and has yet to rebound. Kim Young-gil. Arirang News. Now, South Korea's third and final group of health professionals who were sent to Sierra Leone to help out in the global fight against Ebola are now safely back in Korea. And while their efforts have been pretty successful and the number of new cases is falling fast in the worst hit countries, an international medical organization has slammed world powers for dragging their feet at the onset of the outbreak. Our Gwon has more. It's been roughly a year since the deadliest Ebola epidemic in history broke out in West Africa. Countries around the world, including Korea, have contributed to the effort to contain the virus. Korea sent medical teams to Sierra Leone, one of the three countries most affected by the virus. It was the first time the country dispatched medical teams to an epidemic of this size. A total of three teams of volunteer doctors and nurses embarked on roughly one-month missions after prior training sessions in England. All members returned home safe, though there was a close call when a rescue worker was pricked by a needle carrying a patient's blood. Tests revealed the worker did not contract the virus. Although the decreasing number of new Ebola patients has also reduced the need for international staff, the fight is not over yet. In Liberia, the first case in around three weeks has officials concerned. 42 days without an Ebola case would have declared the country virus-free. A leading charity group, Paris-based Doctors Without Borders, released a one-year anniversary report on Monday, saying the epidemic could have been contained much earlier. The report criticized the international community, including the World Health Organization, for its slow response. The crisis was declared three months after the first reports of Ebola outbreaks. The charity also blamed local governments for downplaying the situation and not sharing significant data with their organization, suggesting a better controlled crisis could have shrunk the death toll, which currently stands at over 10,000. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. China is winning more support for the launch of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the IMF and the World Bank have pledged to cooperate with it, with key allies of the US, including South Korea, considering taking part in this new bank. Our Song ji has the details. With some 30 countries on the roster as founding members, Beijing is garnering international support for its Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, set to begin operations by the end of the year. World Bank President Jim Yong Kim said the two organizations are discussing how they can work together, while the leaders of the IMF and the Asian Development Bank said they would be happy to cooperate with the new regional lender. Beijing has previously indicated that the AIIB would seek to complement, not compete with, the existing international institutions. However, Washington has cautioned other countries against joining, citing concerns about transparency and Beijing's increased influence in the region. It recently proposed co-financing project with existing development banks, saying it welcomes new multilateral institutions that strengthen the international financial architecture. Meanwhile, Washington's key strategic allies in the region are considering joining the AIIB. Japan and Australia have shown interest but have yet to decide, and Korea is expected to announce its decision this week before the AIIB's deadline of March 31st. Seoul is reportedly seeking a share that's high enough to allow it to participate in decision-making. 
China has offered to fund up to 50% of the $50 billion fund. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. The head of the European Central Bank has been whipping up support for the ECB's 1.2 trillion US dollar sovereign bond buying program. Addressing the European Parliament in Brussels on Monday, Mario Draghi said there's solid evidence that the regional economy is already getting a boost from its quantitative easing program, which was announced uh, two months ago. Currency markets have responded with the euro hitting an 11-year low against the greenback just last Thursday. On rising deflation fears, Draghi forecasts the inflation rate of the eurozone will pick up by the end of this year due to falling oil prices and the depreciation of the local currency. Time now for a look through the global headlines we're following on this Tuesday morning from Seoul. For that, we connect to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Singapore and the world remain in mourning this morning as they honour the life of Lee Kuan Yew, the founding father who led the city-state through independence, separation from Malaysia and into prosperity. An endless stream of tributes were made online and off, including outside the presidential residence of of the Astana, where a book of condolence was made available. Earlier, mourners awaited the arrival of Lee's body outside the residence, as some called out his name. World leaders also sent their deep condolences, China calling the 91-year-old an influential statesman and strategist, Indonesia remembering him as an inspirational leader in Asia, and Malaysia noting Lee's legacy that will be carried forward with the future of Singapore. Lee's body will lie in state at the country's parliament building from Wednesday through Saturday before a state funeral is held next Sunday, which will be attended by several world leaders, including Korea's President Park Geun-hye. The week-long period of national mourning will culminate in a private cremation of Lee Kuan Yew's body. A group claiming to represent the Islamic State Group's hacking division is calling on lone wolf jihadists to attack 100 American troops. The group posted online their names as well as their photos and addresses. It also claimed to have hacked into military databases to access that information. All claims that U.S. authorities, including the FBI, are looking into. A Defense Department spokesperson said he or she could not immediately confirm the validity of the information. Related service members have been notified and advised to stay vigilant. And finally, a deadly multiple vehicle pileup in Peru has left at least 34 people dead and 70 others injured. Authorities say the crash happened early Monday in north central Peru after a bus suddenly swerved into oncoming traffic, crashing into two other buses and a truck. Local media reported among those involved in the crash were a group of Senegalese and evangelicals with the worldwide missionary movement. Movement. Initial investigations suggested the driver of the bus had fallen asleep on the wheel. While deadly bus accidents are not uncommon in Peru, this is the country's most deadly since October 2013. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in swimming, where Park Taehwan has finally received the suspension after a hearing with FINA in Lausanne, Switzerland on Monday. Now, despite having his legal team ready at the hearing, he was still slapped with an 18th month ban for the use of the testosterone shot in the Beto. And despite losing his six medals from the 2014 Incheon Asian Games, the good news is he's still able to participate in the 2016 Rio Summer Games, which will kick off in August of next year. 
His 18th month ban starts from September 3rd of last year to March 2nd of 2016, giving him roughly five months to prepare for the Summer Olympics. Now on a brighter note and over to the JTBC Founders Cup, which finished off as four days of the event. And by the end of the tournament, yet another Korean went home with the trophy. And this time it's the 19-year-old super rookie in Kim Hyo-ju who shot a 5-under 67 on the final day to finish off with 21-under par overall to beat out American Stacy Lewis by three strokes. Now the latest win gives her her second LPGA title of her career and the first title this season, becoming the fifth Korean in six LPGA Tour events to win a trophy this season. Now spring is in the air, which means baseball's right around the corner as the 2015 KBO season kicks off this Saturday with 10 teams playing for the first time in the league's history. But on Monday, those 10 teams came together for a media day. And of course, with the Samsung Lions winning four consecutive Korean series titles, the focus was on manager Ryu jung Il, who believes it'll be tougher this season as he chose the SK Wyverns and the Nexon Heroes as the teams to beat. But of course, it's anybody's title to win as the league will see an increase in the number of games from 128 games to 144 games. And now over to the second round of the best of five KBL playoff series between the Incheon AT Line Elephants and the Wonju Dongbu Promi. Now, both teams with one win each look to get a one game advantage after Monday night. So let's take a look at the highlights from Incheon. Now another low-scoring game between the two sides here as Tongbu takes a slim 13-11 lead after the first quarter before both teams go into the halftime tied 27-27. And while AT Lang quickly changes the rhythm of the game thanks to captain Ricardo Powell and his 17 points, 13 rebounds, Tongbu shuts them down in the fourth quarter with their tight defense, outscoring AT Lang 18-6 to take game three 55-51 and are now one win away from their first trip to the championship series in three years. And meanwhile, over to the first round of the best of three playoff series in the men's V-League. Now, OK Savings Bank and Kepco Vicstorm faced off on Monday night with OK Savings Bank one win away from their trip to the championship series. And just like game one, both sides going back and forth the whole night as Kepco takes the first and fourth set while OK Savings Bank takes the second and third sets of the game. And with the series on the line, the decisive fit set an exciting one to say the least, but in the end, it's the sea monster Robert Landy Simone who leads the way for the OK Savings Bank, taking a final set for a 3 2 victory to advance to a championship series against the Samsung Waja Blue Fangs. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning, I'm Lee Ji-yeon here with your latest weather update. It's colder this morning. The low has dropped to freezing side again in some parts, including here in the capital. And chillier air will be around throughout the morning, so dress warmly for your morning commute. But readings will rise rapidly to the low teens, uh, marking slightly higher than yesterday. But beware of big temperature gaps and again, dress accordingly. Sunny skies will greet the day and the air quality will remain at an average range throughout the day today across the nation. But dryness got worse now. Dry weather advisory has been upgraded to warning in the capital area. So drink plenty of water to stay hydrated and lots of, lots of parts of the country are also very dry. And also strong gusty winds will continue which could trigger wildfire. So be always on the lookout for anything that could cause fire. On that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. A daytime high here in the capital and Gwangju will rise to 12 and Daegu and Busan will peak at 14 and 13 respectively. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of 10 and 13 and Dokdo will make it to 6 this afternoon. Well, that's all for Korea and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, those are the stories we've been following on this Tuesday morning in Seoul. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour. Have a wonderful day and do stay tuned to Arirang TV. Goodbye.